fun. Thank you for coming. Still trickling in. You can find seats. There's a couple seats up in front here, too, for anyone that wants to come in. Um, thank you all for coming. And uh, thanks, Ed, for that introduction. It is a very remote place. I was looking at uh, the weather maps last night, and it is below zero in Yakutsk all week this week. Uh, it's going to get up into the single digits during the day, but it's down below freezing, down below zero, F, uh, there already. So it's a cold, remote place, and it's my privilege to work there. Um, it's also my privilege to have I got two of the students that went with me on this trip this summer as part of the Players Project are here in the front, uh, Max Janicek and Kayla Henson. Up, up, up. <laughs> and we're going to talk about some of the research they've done, and they can chime in sort of at any point if they think I'm getting too off track. Um, so the, uh, I'm going to talk about work we do on the Kolyma River up in northeastern Siberia. It is one of the remotest places on the planet. Uh, we travel uh, 19 time zones from here to get there, and we fly all the way around the world uh, for, for vague reasons that I'll try and explain uh, to get there. And we wind up there on the Kolyma River uh, in, near the town of Chersky. And we live on, there's 20 of us. We go from five different US universities and a Russian university. And we go and we live on this barge, uh, which has 20, different, has 20 bunks on it, rooms inside of it. And then we use it as our, uh, it's, we, we study how climate change is impacting the Arctic. And we take this barge up and down the Kolyma River, uh, going deep into the boreal forest and all the way out to the estuary of the Arctic Ocean, um, of the estuary of the Kolyma on the Arctic Ocean, to study how climate is impacting uh, the northern high latitudes. And so this is a. Uh, this is, you're going to get full service. You're going to get your full price today. I'm going to show you a couple of videos of some of the work we've done up there. And then I'm going to talk for a little bit, too. So the first thing I'm going to do um, is we talk about it. We'll give you an introduction of how the player, what the Players Project is. I'll talk a little bit about some of the science we do. And then I'll focus a lot on the outreach and education that we do as part of the Polaris Project. And I'll explain what that is in just a second. So the first thing is we're going to. Um, Enjoy multimedia presentation. Here we go. From the top. I think this is a hell hole. It's a mucky, filthy stream. It's buggy. It's uh, slow, disgusting, but I think it's an awesome place to do science. <laughs> There's two seats up in front here, too, if you want to sit. Uh, now, two red eyes to get to Moscow. We're going to leave Moscow later this morning to get on an afternoon flight. There will be another red eye to the city of Yakutsk. From Yakutsk, we'll wait another day and then get on another flight, fly another four hours on a turboprop in Cherisky. When we're done with that, we'll fly 19 time zones and over 11,000 miles to get to Moscow. The Polaris Project is this field course in Siberia, but it's actually a lot more than that. And the thought was to bring the students and professors to the Arctic to bring some new ideas, to increase the creativity, and try to also put them on Arctic research. They were all people that I could imagine being cooped up with for a month in a very remote location under very harsh conditions. They were fun people. They were people that were flexible, that could handle tough conditions and still keep a positive attitude. They were just a, a nice group of sharp scientists. The students bring a different perspective, they bring enthusiasm, they bring a level of idealism that some of the older scientists don't have. They refresh all of us. They're not afraid to ask what may seem like silly questions. I'm sure at times this was a very rich region. It was a big seaport which received supplies for the whole gold mining region. Then it was town was very big. It was lots of ships, boats. After the Soviet Union collapsed, it all stopped. Town became like four times, five times smaller. There is much less population, no economy. Like there is everything is out of profit in Chersky. <coughs> it was easy to buy huge barges, well, not for a very high price. That exchange scarred for 
this barge. He had a car, I think, uh, of uh, Jeep and he exchanged Jeep for the barge. What is carbon? Carbon is everything around us. Carbon is trees. Carbon is us. Carbon is our houses. Carbon is everything we put in our mouths to eat. It's a major part of our atmosphere. It makes it a major part of what our soils are. So central to the climate change issue is the emission of carbon to the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a heat trapping gas. We've known carbon dioxide as a heat trapping gas through 120 years of physics. And we've known that carbon has been accumulating in the atmosphere for about the last uh, 60 years. Bacteria eat soil carbon the way that people eat food. Bacteria are now getting into the permafrost and exchanging that with the atmosphere. So they eat the soil carbon and they respire it. They emit CO2 the same way we emit CO2. When we take food, we eat carbon and we then respire carbon dioxide out. Bacteria are doing the same thing. The thing that's potentially interesting in the Arctic is that the soil carbon that the bacteria are eating have been frozen for thousands or tens of thousands of years. So it's like they're, the bacteria are sitting down to their breakfast, but that breakfast has been in the freezer for the last 20,000 years. It, once the ball starts rolling, once the atmosphere starts warming, it can continue to warm and warm and warm. This area of the Arctic we're working in might be a carbon bomb that's waiting to go off. All this carbon that is stored in the permafrost that is now thawing and now can move freely between the atmosphere and the biosphere and as that starts to take place, we have the potential for having even accelerated warming that goes beyond what's coming out of people's tailpipes in terms of fossil fuel combustion. There's more carbon stored in the uh, top two meters of the permafrost soil in this area of Russia than there is in the atmosphere already today. There's a lot of soil carbon. Place we've ever had to work. 
gives you a taste of what the Polaris Project is. I'll actually give you now a quick summary. I'll give you a definition of what it is. The Polaris Project is a, uh, a collaborative effort between five different US universities and a Russian university to take undergraduates to northeastern Siberia to have them do primary research into how climate change is impacting the Arctic. That's what we do. A big part of what we do is the science, but an equally big part of what we do is the outreach and communication, teaching the students how to do the science, but also how to communicate that and how to become uh, effective citizens as well as good scientists. So that was a quick overview and introduction onto the Polaris Project. Um, the photographer that produced these and has shot these uh, pictures was, was, was going um, to try and come here today. He lives down in Seattle, a guy named Chris Linder, and he couldn't come as his toddler was sick, unfortunately. Um, but all the images I'm going to show you essentially are going to be images that Chris took um, and part of our effort to bring professional uh, media people along with us to help document and explain what we're doing. So I'll talk for a little bit now about the science we're going to do, the science that we do as part of the Polaris Project. Um, so again, we go to northeastern Siberia for a month. We live on a, in a floating laboratory at the Northeast Science Station which is the uh, world's longest continuously operating, year-round operating Arctic observatory. It was started by um, uh, Sergei Zimov, who you saw in the video. Now it's, uh, a lot of the science there is done by his son, Nikita Zimov. Um, uh, Sergei Zimov at one point was one of, uh, one of the Soviet Union's uh, leading academicians. Um, and now he runs, a, uh, he runs its top-notch top uh, research institute in the Siberian Arctic, which we go, we live on the barge, the science station also has very good analytic capabilities in terms of doing uh, 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 both chemistry and biological research, and we take advantage of those 
while we're there. Uh, a lot of the stuff we do, though, is, uh, as you saw in the video, a lot of stuff is sort of done, held together with spit and duct tape. Um, and uh, getting resources up into northeastern Siberia is very, very difficult. Uh, there's no Home Depot. Um, there's, uh, there's no grocery store. There's no doctor. Um, there's a doctor that comes through Chersky uh, every few months and, uh, and, uh, and sees people that need to be seen. So, you know, we, we do a lot of things uh, uh, ad hoc. Um, and then there's always the creative part of science. Uh, you know, here you have back of the envelope science. Here we have back of the chocolate bar uh, science as we were sort of taking notes on, on the kind of work we were doing there. So again, just to get you all sort of focused on where we are and where, you know, where this is again. So you know, we are down here. Okay? We're here. This is, we're looking down on the top of the planet, right? We have uh, northern United States, Canada, Alaska. And then we have Russia. One of the things is. We're very interested in how the Arctic is changing in response to climate variability for a variety of physical reasons, which I won't go into. Uh, the Arctic is the place that's going to be exhibiting signs of climate change first on the planet. It has to do with a variety of different factors. Um, most of what we know about the Arctic scientifically, international science community, comes from what we understand about Alaska. Because we understand a lot about Alaska. The US contributes a lot to the international body, uh, you know, body of knowledge scientifically. However, almost all of the Arctic is Russia. Okay, Russia spans 11 time zones, um, and the vast majority of what what takes place in the Arctic takes place in Russia, and very little is known about uh, Arctic science in Russia. Uh, the Soviets had uh, had very good science programs um, that fell apart when the Soviet Union collapsed. There's not a culture for Russian scientists to publish their data or their research in international journals. They tend to publish in Russian uh, journals. And the state of science in Russia right now is absolutely abysmal. Um, we toured, not this year, and last year I, I went to, I went to uh, Russia. We went through Moscow and we toured the Russian Academy of Sciences uh, headquarters. They can't afford to keep the lights on. Every other chandelier was dark in the Russian Academy of Sciences building. There is no funding there. The scientists that we work with, the, the chief scientists who would be full professors at, uh, at places like Harvard, uh, and MIT that are in the range of about eighteen to twenty thousand dollars a year. Um, PhD scientists uh, uh, earn, in many cases, under ten thousand dollars a year to do science in Russia. Very, very difficult. So one of the, we go there to study Russian science, uh, Russian Arctic. We bring international uh, scientists in to do work there. We bring a very high caliber of scientists, and we bring resources there for Russian scientists to do work. So again, we're down here. We're going to be working up in. Uh, in northeastern Siberia, and I'll go through this. It'll give a sort of quick lapse of you know where we're going. So we fly all the way around the world. This is the northeast. This is northeastern Russia, northeastern Siberia. This is the Kolyma River, the world's largest river that's underlain by continuous permafrost. This is the town of Chersky, which at one point was a Soviet, uh, for, a very uh, furthest toward northern reach of the Soviet Empire. And this here is the Northeast Science Station, a small collection of buildings um, and boats that sits along on the Kolyma River. Um, where we do the scientific research. The Kolyma River is very important. It's, uh, it's one of the uh, largest rivers in the Arctic. It's about two miles wide. It's many of the points where we're, research, we're doing research on it. It gets even more, it gets even wider down towards the mouth uh, at the Arctic Ocean. It flows north into the Arctic Ocean. The entire river basin is underlain by permafrost. That means that the ground, uh, the entire river basin is frozen solid. There's about, during the summer, there's about uh, 30 centimeters of ground that is thawed. And below that, it is solid. And you can put a shovel in, you can put a piece of metal in, and you, it seems like you hit a rock every time. You put it down, you hit a rock, clink, go another inch, clink, clink, clink. The ground is frozen absolutely solid. And it's thawing very, very rapidly. Permafrost is thawing. Um, there are uh, soils now that are active, meaning there's microbes that are exchanged in the atmosphere that have been frozen for the last, uh, since, during, since the last ice age. This is an area that was ice free during the last ice age did not have glaciers on it, and was home to a massive uh, steppe ecosystem, a grassland ecosystem dominated by mammoths and other Pleistocene megafauna. As Ed mentions, we're in the Saha Republic, uh, which was briefly uh, an independent uh, entity after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The uh, Russians reeled it back in. It has very, very low population density, um, but has incredible mineral wealth, uh, gold and uh, uh, gold especially. This area has sort of been reeled back in, but it is an area about the size of Europe um, with, a, with 
very, very few people living in it. This is what it looks like. This is from a small hill overlooking uh, the town, uh, overlooking towards Chersky. Chersky town, uh, as you saw in the video, it had been, a, had been a very prosperous town. It had been very high, uh, been a gold mining region uh, for uh, people that worked for the, in the Soviet Union. It, it commanded for a while the highest salaries in Soviet Russia uh, to go there and work. It was very prestigious to work there. It was an intellectual haven. Um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, that all disappeared. The town went from um, about 15,000 people now to about uh, just over 1,000 people um, and uh, is, uh, has no economy, uh, tremendous poverty, tremendous alcoholism. Um, the science station is really the only thing, the only thing going now in Chersky, which is these, this group of buildings down in here. So this is what it looks like above ground. If you get below ground, this is what it would look like. <laughs> this area did not have glaciers during the last ice age. For, for a variety of reasons having to do with atmospheric circulation, uh, basically the big glacier that was over North America and the big glacier that was over uh, Western Europe uh, kept the jet stream moving in a way that brought a lot of cold, dry air up through uh, the entire Sahara Republic in an area that went actually, a biome that extended from France all the way to China was ice-free and dominated by Pleistocene megafauna. Uh, and we find, in many of these areas, we find the remnants of Pleistocene megafauna quite literally littering the ground. Um, the first year I was out there, I tripped over a mammoth bone and fell in the mud. Um, <laughs> and we, uh, we've, we've all found, uh, we've found mammoth bones, um, parts of mammoth tusks, um, and, uh, teeth, all kinds of megafauna that are up there. Uh, the skulls of cave lions. Uh, we are not paleontologists, however. Paleontologists do do work up there. Well, the kind of work we're doing as part of the Polaris Project is focused on trying to document how carbon is moving in and out of this landscape. The reason the Arctic is so important, and this part of the, this part of the Russian Arctic especially important, is there's a tremendous amount of soil carbon that's stored in the top several meters of permafrost up there that as the climate warms will start to thaw and release CO2, which is a heat trapping gas, and release methane, which is another heat trapping gas. It's, it's a gas that's actually about 20 times more potent, a greenhouse gas, than carbon dioxide. That starts going into the atmosphere. and goes moves from the atmosphere down into the biosphere and back and forth. These units here are, we're going to talk about units of carbon, how much carbon there actually is up there. Um, this here, this PG means a petagram. A petagram is 10 to the 15 grams, which is a million billion grams, which is like the number you make up when you want to say something's really big. Okay? <laughs> so there are 750 million billion grams of carbon in the atmosphere. Across the Arctic, there are, there's about an equal amount of carbon that is potentially able to start moving between the atmosphere and the biosphere as thawing starts to take place. Uh, there's about 100 petagrams of carbon in boreal forests. There's you know, anywhere between 100 and 500 petagrams in the top meter of soil across the Arctic. There's a lot of carbon stored in lakes, dissolved organic and inorganic carbon that's sitting in the lakes that as, uh, as climate warms, it starts interchanging chemically and biologically with the atmosphere. There's a, a lot more in the tundra soils north of the tree line. And then you get down into the very huge carbon pools that are in, in, very in, in deep permafrost, more than a few meters beneath the ground. Um, and, the amount of carbon that's in those uh, landscapes is unimaginable, maybe 10,000 petagrams of carbon. Um, there's very little chance that this will start interchanging with the atmosphere. There's a very good chance, and in fact, we're, the, some of the work we do has do been documenting how much ca carbon is now being exchanged between the boreal forest soils and with the atmosphere. This is, this, again, this is carbon that has been out of play for the last, uh, over the course of the last ice age and is now interchanging with the atmosphere as soil bacteria get in there and start to uh, respire it, start to chew it up. So that's, the kind of, that's, that's sort of the fundamental organizing principle. What we're studying up there is we're studying how this moves around. Now, I'm a forest ecologist by training. Uh, I study how carbon moves from the atmosphere down into forests, how forests take in carbon as they do photosynthesis. They take carbon out of the atmosphere. They store it in their wood. Uh, as that wood breaks down and starts to decay, that carbon then starts moving back into the atmosphere. So that's the kind of stuff I do. That's, uh, I, study how, I study how forests work. And I do that by, uh, I do a lot of field studies, I spent a lot of time poking holes in trees and measuring growth rates. Um, and then I also use a lot of imagery from satellites. And I look down on the top of the planet and I try and measure how green the forests are and I try and understand how that relates to photosynthesis and document what's going to happen as the climate starts warming. One of, the few, uh, one of the few bright spots about climate change would be that if the climate warms the way we think it will, boreal forests cover about 15% of the Earth's surface and this belt around the top of the planet. Uh, as that 
as the globe starts to warm, boreal forests are very cold. Their, their growing season is usually very limited by the short growing season and the cold temperatures. One of the ideas that's out there is that as the climate warms, boreal forests will start to grow more. And as they grow more, they'll start taking some carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and storing it away in their wood. And that will potentially be a negative feedback uh, to climate change. A lot of the work we're doing so far has to do with both measuring that uptake of that carbon into forests and measuring how much respiration takes place on the other end, how much soil bacteria are getting into this, this new source of carbon and ex interchanging that with the atmosphere. So the work we do in the Arctic is impossible to study any one aspect of it. So I can go there and study what happens in the forests, but there's so much carbon in these, in these environments that's being exported into streams and into lakes and into rivers that we need to sort of study the whole budget that's going up there. So the Polaris Project combines terrestrial ecosystem science, but also a lot of work with uh, aquatic, uh, uh, aquatic scientists, aquatic biogeochemists that study how, co how chemicals move through waterways. And so a lot of what we do there is not the kind of stuff that, that I do, but has to do with trying to understand what's happening up here in boreal forests, but also what's happening uh, as the permafrost starts to thaw, this is a permafrost exposure at a place called Devani Yar, where the, uh, the permafrost is eroding very, very rapidly. It's slumping down in here. It's exposing these ice wedges. This is solid ice here. All this, all this area is solid, frozen permafrost soil that is, as the slumps down is being exposed, it's starting to thaw. This soil that is accumulating here is after the ice has melted. These are grasses that are growing here that uh, originated in, during the Pleistocene. Um, that are growing back in here. So these are, this is an ice age landscape that's sort of springing up here as this permafrost thaws. So we study how that carbon moves from this upland boreal forest into the permafrost, from the permafrost into the soils, from the soils into the streams, from the streams into the lakes, and from the lakes into the Coloma River, and how that ultimately all feeds out into the Arctic Ocean of what happens to that entire system. So the way we do this is there's no one way of studying this entire uh, this entire chain. I, I'm a forest ecologist. I, can't, I don't know what happens in the lakes. The lake people don't understand what happens in the streams. The streams people don't understand what happens in the river. So we, get, we got, sort of got everyone together. We're, we're trying to study this whole system. And we each go. We have, uh, we have faculty from these different universities, Carleton College in Minnesota, Holy Cross College, um, University of Nevada, Reno. We all go. We take undergraduate students with us. And we get there, and we turn them loose. And they're the ones that actually do the science and we mentor them in science projects. So we do things, here's one of the students uh, studying how permafrost carbon is accumulating in permafrost soils. This is, uh, this is Kayla, who's sitting right up here doing an experiment on uh, how different amounts of organic carbon and nitrogen in this lake will uh, change primary production, will change how bugs get in there and, and plankton uh, gets in there. We do a lot of uh, chemistry. This is uh, Bill Sobzak, who's a professor at Holy Cross, um, who is uh, taking all these different water samples we're bringing in from all these different uh, places in the ecosystem and he's studying how reactive the carbon that's dissolved in those uh, samples is and how, how readily it, it can interchange with the atmosphere. Um, we also do work with, uh, with measuring the, the reflectivity and the other sort of properties of light uh, that come out of these waters. So we have we combine sort of field work with experiments and a lot of laboratory work to sort of get at these questions. And it's all student driven. Um, we had, this year we had uh, eight different science projects that were student originated and student directed while we were up there. We had a group working with a Russian permafrost scientists from the city of Yakutsk, from the, uh, the Permafrost Institute in Yakutsk, who comes up and mentors students who's studying processes of uh, permafrost erosion and, and carbon content in permafrost soils. Um, we had students studying wetlands and how wetlands were accumulating carbon. We had students working on lakes, studying lake chemistry. Um, we had students who were trying to integrate satellite imagery into, into looking at the entire picture of the Arctic and looking at how the colors of the different lakes related to their uh, chemistry and, how, and related to their carbon exchange with the atmosphere. We had, again, these students, this is Aaron, who was featured in that video you just saw, measuring how carbon moves from the top of the stream down to the bottom of the stream, what happens to it along the way, how, much, how, how uh, active microbes are in respiring it, and how active plankton are in, in getting carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, we had a student who was making multiple measurements along uh, the Coloma River to look at chemistry there. And then here are Max and Kayla, uh, students from Western Washington, studying uh, bugs, macroinvertebrates, small bugs that live in these lakes to try and get an understanding of what the, understanding of what the ecological significance uh, of, this, uh, of, of this community of organisms is like. And I'm, I'll, we'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, and then we had a student who was interviewing fishermen 
to understand, try and get, try and get an understanding from them how the environment has changed over the last 50 years. What has, what changes have been like in the fishery? One of the things that's happened up there is it had been a very, very rich fishery during Soviet times, um, and there's been uh, the fishery essentially had collapsed, and he's. Uh, he was able to sort of interview these fishermen and find out that the fish assemblage sort of moved over from being this very tasty white fish to areas that are now these lakes that are completely dominated by gigantic pike. Um, and uh, the, also there's a collapse. So this is where uh, uh, caviar sturgeon, uh, Siberian sturgeon, endangered species, uh, been, had been one of the richest fisheries in the world for that fish. Um, that fishery has totally collapsed as well. It's one of the only things that's illegal to gather up there um, are sturgeon. Um, but it still happens quite a bit. The cool thing about this is that we get these students, they do this primary research along with us, um, and then they take that, and they've, the project's only been going for a couple of years, um, but they're able to take that science and communicate it to an international science audience and also use it, take their science, and bring it back to people and do education along with it. Uh, this is a group of scientists from the first year. This is Tyler Llewellyn, who was a uh, Western Washington uh, senior. He's now off in graduate school. Um, he was our department's outstanding senior during, uh, during last year. Here, he's uh, here at the American Geophysical Union Conference, uh, probably the most uh, uh, widely respected uh, gathering of, of geophysical scientists in the world. Um, and he's there with other undergraduates from the Polaris Project and with uh, the ZMOFs, the scientists that run the Northeast Science Station, who come over every year for this conference. And they went and presented some of their research. They presented their data on how drained lake basins um, which are, are lakes that are underlain by permafrost, and those lakes can drain catastrophically when the permafrost melts and completely change over the, sort of the environment, going from an aquatic environment to a terrestrial environment in a matter of a couple of years. And they've sort of taken their measurements of what dissolved organic carbon was like and, and presented that information to, to, uh, to international scientific community. Um, and then they also come back, and the, the students do that, and they also, many of them go back and they talk at their high schools about their experience. Um, and they do other sort of public outreach as part yeah. of that. The stuff, some of the other stuff that's starting to come out about this is um, I'm interested in how these trees are starting to grow here. I'm try interested in taking tree cores, taking, taking small cores out of the trees, measuring the ring widths on the trees, and then trying to relate that to the measurements we get of how well the forests have been growing from space. And so to get this information, it was, I needed to start working at the site of this network around on the top of the planet and start measuring tree growth over time. And it's this really nifty thing where we've actually been able to document so far that the measurements we get from space of essentially how green the forests are are very good at recording how well the forests are actually growing. So we're able to, we're able to look down from a satellite and measure basically a bunch of green goo that we see from space. And I'm able to go and tie that measurement of green uh, goo directly into the r annual rings of the trees that are growing there. And from that, I'm able to start backing out how well the trees are growing, how much carbon they're sucking out of the atmosphere. Um, and it's, it's, a really neat, uh, it's a really neat project. And that is, is a big focus of the Polaris Project. So we do a lot of great science as part of the Polaris Project. But I think uh, maybe what's most important about the Polaris Project is the efforts we make into doing education, um, both educating scientists uh, about the work we do, educating undergraduates who become primary scientific researchers as part of this trip, and then the outreach we do to the public trying to communicate the research that we do uh, along the way. Um, there's the field course portion of the Players Project where we take these undergraduates and we bring them to Siberia. We can't bring that many students to Siberia. Um, there's 20 bunks on the barge. It's very, very expensive. The students who go, Max and Kayla didn't spend a dime on this project. They were actually paid to go along the project. Um, it's, it's, it's a fully funded project. And as part of that, they do a lot of re uh, outreach uh, along with that. Back at, on all the campuses across the country, um, Western Washington, uh, Carleton College, St. Olaf College, Clark University, uh, uh, Holy Cross College, um, uh, I probably forgot some. And at, the, and at uh, Yakut State University in Russia, all of the scientists that are involved with this teach classes where we, we explain the science of the Polaris Project to undergraduates. So I teach a class, I'll teach a class this winter, uh, ESCI 492, where we study Arctic system science. And we explain the results of this research. And I'll do that. There'll be 50 students that will take that this winter. Every one of these colleges will have 50 students that will take, that, take, take their classes on Arctic system science. And then we do a lot of public outreach as part of this. So this is uh, Brian Cantor, who's one of the students from St. Olaf, the one who's doing, interviewing the fishermen. 
He also took charge of interviewing a lot of the students about their research projects. Uh, this is Blaze, who was one of the students studying river chemistry. And they would sit down, they would uh, explain their research, and we take audio, we take video, we take uh, still photos, and we try and come up with these products that will disseminate the science as widely as possible. And we do this through sort of a variety of means. One of the main things that we, ways we do this is we do outreach through our website, the, uh, which is thepolarisproject.org. Um, and we communicate the science that's going on here. We also, uh, we also have a blog where we, students reflect on their experiences while they're in the field. Um, and they explain what's going on. And we, we, we have photographs. We also, exp we also uh, reach out through a variety of sort of social networking, which has been really, uh, really nifty. Um, here are two blog posts that were written by our students, uh, by Kayla and Max this year. Uh, Kayla wrote a uh, sort of, they, they both made these sort of photo rich blog posts where they explained some of the work they were doing uh, uh, in fitting both of their personalities. So they found Kayla's was very heartfelt and sincere and had these great images and was very emotionally powerful. Max has a robust sense of humor. Uh, and <laughs> Wrote, a, wrote this hilarious blog post, which became one of our, became our, one of our most widely read ones, uh, where he explained what, what it was really like, which included things about the bugs, uh, about the outhouse that dangles off the back of the barge, um, um, about the, uh, the, the quantities of dill and moose that we eat, um, which I, the, you measure the dill by the pound and the moose by the uh, hundreds of pounds that we go through while we're there. So we do this neat outreach where the students are communicating informally along the way. We also do a lot of outreach through sort of social media. Um, we use Twitter to communicate with people that follow our field course along the way, and they can get, get updates. And we have a satellite uh, internet communication system while we're there, so we're updating uh, all of our work, you know, sort of live every day. We're updating, we're giving photographs, and we're we're uh, telling stories about the kind of work we've done. We also go through Facebook, because a lot of you will recognize Facebook here. We've got a group. Uh, what do we have? 151 fans right now on our site, where uh, they sort of follow what we're doing uh, on Facebook. So we have a, this huge sort of outreach that happens. Um, and then we work on communicating the science sort of a little more formally through what we're calling science stories. And these are uh, work that was, is uh, produced by undergraduates and by the, the project scientists, um, and then picked up by places like the New York Times. Uh, this uh, summer, while we were in the field, we had uh, the New York Times cover the Polaris project. and. Uh, had, there's a story in the Science Times about it. There's also this multimedia <laughs> slideshow that was hosted on the New York Times online, which featured work that we were doing about, uh, about uncovering mammoth bones and other sort of uh, fossils in these areas with rapidly eroding permafrost. The science stories end up being a really neat part of what we're doing. And it's something new we're doing this year. The video I showed you at the beginning was that 10 minute overview, uh, which gives an idea of what's going on with the Polaris project. That video has been it's shown very, very widely. Um, it was, it's been shown to, uh, to school kids all around the country. Uh, it's been shown at uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, it was shown uh, uh, to President Obama's science advisor, John Holdren, um, who used to be at the Woods Hole Research Center. And uh, Max Holmes, the director of the project, recently took that video and showed it uh, at the Sidwell Friends School, which is where Obama's uh, kids go to school. So that video was seen by, uh, by, uh, by, Obama's, by the elder Obama daughter, Sasha. Is that the Malia? Which Malia is the older one? Yeah, it's been seen by Malia. Um, so it's it's getting really wide release, and now we're also trying to produce science stories about each of those eight research projects that I sort of described at the beginning: the students doing research on streams, the students doing research on rivers, and the students doing research on bugs. And so now you are here for the global debut <laughs> of uh, we just finished working on the bug team, which was Max and Kayla were the bug team. We just finished working on the bug team's uh, science story. And it's about a five minute long video. And that's, we'll close, it out, uh, close the talk out with that. And then I'll take some questions when we're done. So here is here's the bug team. Max and Caleb, never seen this. Take off most of my mosquito gear and roll up my pant leg so I can hopefully dig through the organic matter and get down into the soil. But that. Organic matter is really, can I curse? <laughs> <laughs> really thick. <laughs> and yeah, I'm kind of overwhelmed right now. I wish I could have gotten in there, but we grabbed some of the massive water vegetation, this is about water vegetation, this is, and now we're 
hopefully if I didn't leave something in there. So I'm really itchy all over my body. <laughs> Me and Max specifically have been taking sediment samples and looking at how many macroinvertebrates or small insects that live in the bottom of the lakes, how many there were and uh, what were the different types that lived there. So we were comparing between different lakes and also between the different sides of lakes, the eroding side and the non-eroding side. class that was using basically looking at bugs that you find in the bottom of a river or in the bottom of a stream and based on not only the abundance of what you find but also the diversity of what you find to really draw information about what's going on in the surrounding environment be it the sediment the ground or the water above it and it's pretty interesting that you know just by looking at bugs little insects that you can actually learn a lot about the rest of the system insects as being these like airborne winged creatures. The majority of their life is actually spent in an aquatic stage and I think that's pretty cool. We are finding you know, mosquito larvae, fly larvae, little maggots, all sorts of cool stuff that when they're adults that's when they kind of rise to the surface and fly off. That's where we're more familiar with them. So we are going to go to Sea Lake and get mud up from the bottom of the lake that had insects living in it. So we took a bucket and cut a hole in it. So we pushed the bucket down to get one known area. And that ended up giving us way more sediment than we needed. So we took that back to try and pick through it. And we stayed up till two in the morning and only had like a quarter of it done. So then we finally searched around to find a piece that goes to a stove pipe. So we used, we actually used the stove pipe and the bottom of our bucket to scoop it out and then had this little core of sediment. After we got back, we had this bag of soil and sediment from the bottom of the lake and some water in it. So we would pour this mud, this stuff, through a soil sifter, little by little, and sift out all of the fine sediment. And then we'd have detritus, like decaying sticks and stuff in there, a little bit of vegetation, and hopefully a lot of bugs. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> a lot of times it was a, it was a, few, a few bugs, you know, look for the worms, look for the things moving. <laughs> It was Daphnia. Time to zooming? Daphnia. Daphnia, Daphnia, Daphnia. But <laughs> Max and I learned a lot about each other doing it. So we, we talked a lot. So it was a funny experience. Sometimes we'd actually have several people helping us do this, which was really nice. So we'd have to find bigger containers that could hold a little bit of water. And so we'd go in the kitchen and borrow this big white baking pan. Max found this huge piece of white styrofoam that we started using. So um, yes, everything was very much MacGyver. I think our most realistic goal with this would be that the fact that we can hopefully establish a little bit of baseline data about macro invertebrate populations here, just because we looked online, we've looked in books, no one has taken the time to look at these things before, especially in a region like the Coloma. You know, the Coloma watershed is underlain by complete permafrost, and that's a big deal. That really kind of defines the landscape. I really think what we see here is probably going to be unique, and I hope that as the years go by, someone can come in here and you know maybe look at what we did, get some ideas on you know, how to improve it, but also you know, just go out and look for more bugs, see what they find. So that's your been in the presence of, uh, of greatness. <laughs> That's gonna that finish up the talk here. I'd be happy to take questions. Max and Kayla are here to get questions. And mostly I would like to take the chance to thank Max and Kayla for coming on the trip. Um, we go with some of the we go with some very high powered universities on this. And the, the years we've done this trip, uh, the Western students have been uh, been some of the very best students we've had along the way. And the other faculty at other universities ask me every year how we managed to get such fantastic students. And I think it really speaks well. Uh, it speaks well about Western, it speaks well about Huxley, it speaks well about the great quality of students we get. So mostly I want to thank, thank Max and Kayla uh, for coming along on this trip. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Was there really no way you could travel five time zones instead of 19? There's not a lot of direct flights between here and Chersky. 
Well, I mean, um, like like maybe from here to Anchorage and then from there to Vladivostok. There's no, and there's there. no, there's no flights to Russia. Uh, the only way to fly to Russia um, is to fly through Europe. Um, there's not a single flight from the U.S. or Canada. Back me up here, Ed. No, he's completely right. <laughs> I, go, I do my research on the western central part of Siberia, and uh, you have to go all, all the way through Moscow because there's flights from Moscow to all of the major cities of, of North Asia. But between the cities of North Asia, there's nothing but you want to walk. Yep. So there, there is no way around it. Yeah, the spoke, the hub, of the, the hub in Russia is Moscow, and Moscow is eight time zones from where we end up. Right. Um, so you got to go to Moscow. Well, they could make a lot of tourist money if they opened it up. And had some Ed and I would go, and uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bill. Uh, there's a recent poll showing Americans have gone from 77 percent to right. uh, 50 or 47. 47. Yeah. In some, I think, well, you're, you, you probably know best about it than I do. Uh, this is Bill Dietrich, who uh, runs the environmental journalism program at Huxley. Uh, I think some of it is, uh, is fatigue. Um, you know, climate, warming, climate change is, a, is uh, happening on a scale that we're not very good at, at perceiving. It's something that's going to unravel over decades to centuries as opposed to years. And we get things like uh, we have La Nina conditions last year in the tropical Pacific, caused cool weather. Uh, still about a degree above the baseline for what temperatures are like in this part of the have been like in this part of the globe, um, but cooler than you know it had been uh, from the summer before that. So people perceive that as being cooler. Um, and there's also, frankly, been a very careful, carefully orchestrated campaign um, by uh, industry groups that are opposed to the science of, of climate change for political reasons that have 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 have, have sowed disinformation, deliberately sowed disinformation. Um, and that's just the way it, that's the way it is. Um, and uh, um, my bottom line about climate change is, look, look, if the science is so robust, if climate change wasn't a real thing, it would be fascinating, because it would mean everything that we thought we understood about the Earth would be wrong. Um, and so if, if, <laughs> if I came up with a way of disproving anthropogenic climate change, it would be Darwin, Einstein, and Bunn. I mean, it would be that big a deal. Um, and so I would, well, I, fanta fantastic. If there's no climate change, anthropogenic climate change, that is wonderful. We're not going to have these impacts from it, and we're also going to have opened up uh, the, the most fascinating uh, science of the next century. So it would be fantastic. I'm not holding my breath. Uh, last week, I think, was uh, on PBS uh, Evening News. They had a section on ice cores mm -hmm. in Greenland. And if I understood it correctly, they were saying that, like, 10, 15,000 years ago, based upon the measurements in the ice cores, uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was, I think, higher than it is today. And to yeah. my knowledge, there wasn't any of the industrial activity at that point. Um, Doug, you want to handle this? No way. <laughs> um, one of the geology faculty members here is quite good at this. Um, there was, uh, so there was a period called uh, the Younger Dryas, uh, about 12,000 years ago, of which um, during, as we came out of the last glaciation, we had, uh, we had sort of uh, massive freshening of the North Atlantic as, uh, as, uh, ice, as fresh water built up behind ice dams that then burst and flooded out. That's when you had uh, um, you know, these sort of massive intrusions of, of fresh water into, uh, um, into the North Atlantic. It completely changes the way that ice accumulates in the Greenland ice core. It changes the chemistry of it. Carbon dioxide levels have certainly not been higher. Uh, if, that was, if that was what was presented, that's incorrect. The carbon dioxide levels have never been higher uh, than they are now over the past several million years. Um, there are tremendous fluctuations in the carbon dioxide record over time. Carbon goes up and down in the atmosphere depending on slowly evolving relationships between the Earth's climate and the oceans, particularly the balance of carbon dioxide that sits dissolved in the oceans fluctuates between the atmosphere back and forth. Um, and as that carbon dioxide fluxes back and forth between the atmosphere and the oceans, it does change the climate. That's a completely natural part of the Earth's system. I mean, we, we spent, of the last several million years, we spent 90% of those in an ice age. We're not in an ice age now. We're in an interglacial period. That has nothing to do with human activity. This has to do with the way that the, Earth, uh, the Earth's orbit changes over uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of years, and particularly how whether or not the top of the planet, uh, the northern hemisphere with all that land mass, is pointed towards the sun or not. Um, and what that actually shows is that as the slowly evolving Earth orbit relationships change, the amount of sunlight coming to the planet changes slightly. As the planet warms a very small amount, uh, carbon dioxide starts outgassing from the oceans. 
which starts a feedback effect, which starts warming the planet up. So the, the temperature goes up on the planet, carbon dioxide levels start coming up, they, for that further warms the planet and takes us into this like, periods like this current interglacial we're in now. So the ice core data actually demonstrate conclusively that carbon dioxide is a heat trapping gas. And it, it gives us this record, it's a beautiful record over, over the past, uh, the, the most detailed record from uh, Antarctica goes back almost a million years right now and shows how climate warming is affected by carbon dioxide levels. Um, and that's independent of industrial activity. But that doesn't mean that the mechanism is still the same. Carbon dioxide traps that heat. What we've done since the Industrial Revolution is we've taken a bunch of carbon that's been in the ground in par as part of the lithosphere, and we put that up into the atmosphere. So the mechanism is exactly the same. There's a tremendous amount of climate variability naturally, but that doesn't mean that what's happening now is not a result of, uh, of human-induced greenhouse gas accumulation. Right. How do you differentiate between the warming that's associated with the glacial? Well, we can, you can measure, the, you measure where the carbon's coming from. So the carbon that's accumulating in our atmosphere, we went up from about 280 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere under baseline conditions. We're at over 385 right now. That's come from fossil fuel combustion. And you can measure that fossil fuel combustion based on the isotopic extinguisher of the carbon that's in the atmosphere and the way that uh, atmospheric oxygen levels have declined as a result of that oxidation. So there's, there's actually multiple lines of evidence for that. It's very clearly come from, from uh, fossil fuel combustion. Your point about that if the levels right now are higher than they have been for millions of years, there, is there these fluctuations that are going on naturally, in fact, you know, during the interglacial glacial period, but uh, they go 280 parts per million, what it was pre industrial, was about the highest it got. Over the last three or four million years. Right. Since, since, the, since the Eocene, right? Yeah. Since there were alligators in the Hudson, Hudson Bay. Yeah. Shoot. Is uh, carbon fractionation study going on within here in the total picture? Yeah, that's actually one of the big things that we're, uh, we're doing, particularly with methane. Um, so one of the, uh, we're, we're, we're studying how, as methane is emitting out of, these, out of the lakes we're studying, there's been a vast, there's been a huge expansion of lake area up in this part of Siberia as thermokarst lakes, which are lakes that are, um, have uh, appeared after, uh, after uh, permafrost has eroded underneath the lakes, have started to appear. As permafrost thawing has taken place, those lakes start expanding. They actually start moving down, uh, down slope slightly as the leading edge sort of erodes into the lake. That's not really some of the work that Max and Kale were doing. As that really rich organic material slumps down into the lake, it starts being uh, chewed up in an, in an environment without any oxygen. As that happens, methane is emitted out into the atmosphere. And we actually, the margins of these lakes are bubbling all the time, uh, all year round. Right now they're bubbling. They're bubbling in the middle of winter. They bubble so intensively that some places they don't freeze uh, in the middle of uh, in, in northeastern Siberia where it's routinely 40 below zero in the winter. The bubbles are sort of coming up all the time. A lot of the work we're doing there has to do with trying to figure out how old that carbon is um, by, by, uh, by, looking at, uh, by looking at the isotopic ratio of uh, both, the, both uh, the mechanism by which it was produced um, and by how old that carbon is using C14 and other isotopes to date it. And a lot of this carbon we're finding comes out, some of it's 1,000 years old, some of it's 10,000 years old. Some of the carbon we're finding coming out of these lakes is radiocarbon dead, meaning it's, it's so old that we can't date it with carbon-14, meaning it's Pleistocene. It's, it's stuff that was laid down, was last biologically available during the Pleistocene, which is cool. It's neat stuff. Kate? <laughs> are you doing anything with, um, well, I actually kind of two questions at the same one for both you and Ed. Are you doing anything with um, land animals in relationship to the changes you're seeing at a uh, smaller level? And are you hearing anything from the stories uh, from the people that goes back historically that provides some, some explanation for what's going on? Um. I'll, I'll answer that. I can answer that question very succinctly. No. <laughs> Ed? No, I study languages and, and the history of the people together. Uh, as far as concerns, changes in animals is, is mostly not connected with what you're talking about, but there was over hunting of the fur bearing animals, and now they're reintroducing some of those. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, I that, know that's that. that. Where we work in northeastern Siberia, it's actually amazing. There's so little there um, that animals stay as far away from anything on two legs as they can possibly get. We see nothing. 
we see we might see a bird every every once in a great while, and it's it's amazing because we're in this one of the remotest wildernesses in the in the world, and we see almost no wildlife. Um, we eat a lot of it um, when it comes our way, and the, that's the the diet up there is uh, it costs ten dollars a pound to fly anything in there, and so the diet is insofar as you can make it local is local. Um, so we had a tremendous amount of moose, but the moose uh, because if a moose shows its head anywhere near a person up there, yeah, it goes into the pot. And so we don't we see we see very little. We see a lot of tracks of animals uh, and moose, um, but we see very very little uh, uh, wildlife. Yeah. In a former life, I had used to study birds, and it was something I thought, oh, I may all try and do some bird work while I'm up there too. And uh, yeah, it's an exciting day if you see a bird. <laughs> Right. Um, is there any correlation between what you're seeing and what's going on there? So the news that came out this week, uh, sort of uh, the sort of rapidly developing climate news, is that uh, the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica appear to show what's called dynamic thinning. They appear to be thinning in ways that is not directly related, uh, ways that have not really been understood very well before. Um, that have to do with uh, either ocean water or glacier water getting underneath the ice sheets and lubricating them and helping them flow faster down into the ocean. It's something that's not very well understood. Um, but what it points to up there is that the, what the, the entire picture that's taking place in the Arctic is that the biggest temperature rises we've seen have been in the Arctic. And that has to do with something called the polar amplification, which is something that's been really well understood. Actually, the first guy that ever tried to calculate the Earth's temperature in relation to carbon dioxide concentrations was Fonte uh, uh, Reunius in 1896, who went through these laborious calculations to figure out what would happen to the globe's temperature if we doubled atmospheric carbon dioxide. Um, won the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry, sort of pioneered chemical thermodynamics. Um, and uh, one of the things he predicted in 1896 was that the poles would warm disproportionately to the mid-latitudes because of the difference between incoming radiation to the planet at the equator and the outgoing radiation and infrared radiation at the poles. And he, for a variety of reasons having to do with the reflectivity of the planet and land masses, he thought the poles would, would warm the fastest. And uh, that was in 1896, and it's, it's really been borne out. The, uh, the rate of temperature warming that's taking place in the Arctic um, is uh, many times greater than the global average. Uh, the reductions in sea ice that have been taking place are, uh, have vastly exceeded expectations. They've vastly outstripped the models that have tried to predict what was going to happen with sea ice. It's been much sooner and much more dramatic than expected. The methane concentration that we're seeing uh, come out of the Arctic are also was, was, a, was a part of the global methane cycle that was not really well understood until um, research that was done by our, our Polaris project colleague, uh, a woman named Katie Walter, uh, who first started measuring this methane that was coming out of there. So uh, you know, it is the, the poles are changing very, very quickly and uh, in ways that are not linear, ways that are, are taking these jumps up that we, don't, we, we frankly don't understand. Yeah. But that's where the fun part is, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not a climate change catastrophist by any stretch of the imagination. I actually, you know, I'm not actually sure what the impacts of climate change are going to be. Um, I know that it's going to get a little bit warmer. Sea levels are going to go up some. Um, are we going to have more hurricanes? I don't know. Is it, we going to have more, you know, flooding, more drought? Yeah, maybe. Um, but, you know, the jury's still, a lot of that's still out on that. Um, but the changes we're seeing up there are, even for, as I, I study paleoecology, of what's happened over the last thousand years, and the rate of change we're seeing up there uh, is stunning. Yeah. Meters of erosion in these lakes every year. Hour. All right. So maybe we should give our Everyone scoot. <laughs>